industry. So I kind of I realized over time that I was happy to be the outsider. I've been working on policy with governments all over the world for over 20 years. And so, and I've been advisors to ministers and I've met with heads of state. So like I've been there at the top arguing from a kind of idealistic perspective. We didn't expect to end up on dereliction. But when we came back here, and saw the dereliction and the vacancy, the King heritage, the housing crisis, the homeless crisis, the catalogue of stuff was going on. In an emergency, you need emergency measures. And I think we saw that. It's great that Ireland reacted so well initially to the Ukrainian stuff and allowed people to come and provide mm. support. They were being traumatised. We should not, I mean, again, we should not have 160,000 vacant homes like. Dr. Frank O'Connor, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate spending time with you. Thanks, Connor. Thanks for the invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So first question, where are you from? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in the Cork Kerry border, a place called Kish Game. So it's basically in the Cork side of the border. My mom was from Kerry. My dad was from Cork and they settled on the border. And uh, great part, a uh, very rural, still very rural. Uh, hasn't changed much over the decades. And I grew up, I suppose, looking back, to be honest, Connor. In quite an idyllic environment. Uh, I had uh, I grew up in an environment, I suppose, where we had grew our own food. We walked cycles. Uh, we um, sort of repaired our clothes and had a, such a strong community. And um, we had freedom to roam. And I suppose I was one of those kids uh, with my brother and my friends who literally walked everywhere, the fields, explored the river. We were always making boats and things in the snow and the winter making sleighs. So it was a real, I suppose, looking back in an idyllic lifestyle. And uh, obviously very much didn't travel that much over that period, but definitely got a very strong community background. Like my, my parents are huge into community. My dad, who died recently, he was an amazing community man and his grandfather before him as well. So I kind of grew up with this appreciation of community and and people sort of supporting each other but also appreciation of i suppose what a wonderful environment we had back then you know mm -hmm. and also from a very early age i took a really strong interest in uh, materials from a perspective of i became um i suppose quite a minimalist quite young in my life you know i suppose i got an interest in secondhand stuff very very early on and didn't really buy buy new so um yeah so really i mean i look back now it was idyllic really i just suppose might have, might have a bit of a tin, uh, tin, uh, tint of glasses, I suppose, looking back on it, but I loved it, really. And it really framed a lot of my life from there on, you know. Do you think we're losing that access to that idyllic lifestyle? Do you think? Uh, I suppose I have to look at my, like, I don't have any kids, uh, but I look at my nieces and nephews, who I have suppose got good relationships with over the years, even though I was away for a long time. So I actually missed a lot of their childhoods. But uh yeah, I think we are. I mean, I think they're what they grew up into and what I grew up in is very different. I mean, yeah, mm. I mean, like we literally knew every blade of grass, every ditch, every boarded up house we'd get into. Like we were literally exploring everything all the time. I mean, we'd leave the house in the morning. Mom would, would have breakfast. We'd leave seven or eight or nine o'clock. Myself and my brother would pick up a friend or two on the way walking and we'd literally get back in late that evening. And sometimes we'd have to, be, to be honest, sneak back in at times because our clothes would get all drenched, we'd have fallen into the river, whatever. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just very different. I mean, no technology has changed that. I think fear as well. There's been a fear mm. culture created over the years. But, uh, yeah, I suppose only realizing as I get older and I'm in my 50s now that, yeah, it has changed a lot. And I suppose... I feel very fortunate that I had that freedom. And I suppose it really, like I said, helped me to build a very strong understanding of, you know, even though I grew up in rural Ireland in a quite a small location, how the, the bigger picture, you know, I suppose mm. I've taken that interest. I mean, I've taken that interest. I'm still an explorer. I mean, I'm in my 50s. I still act like a, a kid. I'm always exploring still. I've, I still have like... A good friend of mine in the UK, uh, he was the next door neighbor at the time. And he, uh, he, it was not too long before he died, sadly. But he said to me at the time, he, was, he, he said, never lose your sense of wonder. And I think that's something that I've taken with me. I'm always interested. And I've taken, I suppose, my interest in exploring in the countryside into urban environments. And that's been my life now, really, is where I 
I go to cities and towns and villages and I explore everywhere. I'm mm. just fascinated because I'm fascinated by by people and I'm fascinated by community and I'm fascinated by by the fact that we have a finite resources in our planet and we really are creating systems that don't work. And I'm convinced that we can basically break down current systems and build new ones that are much better for everyone. And I suppose that's been my life is always seeking solutions, you know, looking at where I can apply my skills and knowledge and particularly my passion and interest. Because when I get interested in something, I get interested in something. No, I'm kind of person that's kind of um, obsessive. Yeah, so I would be, I'm hyper. So mm. like a lot of people would say I'm ADHD. I've done like basic tests, and I am definitely ADHD. So I, I'm hyper. But so very, I would have struggled in school with concentration. So like I went through the school system only because my mom was a primary teacher, and she kept an uh, uh, I suppose an eye on me and kept me sort of I suppose on the straight and narrow. Like I mm. went to school when I was three years of age. Wow. Um, and I finished uh, school. I was ex I was suspended in my leaving cert uh, at the age of 16. Now, I, I actually went back and did my leaving cert and ended up going to university. But I was very young. The only reason I went to school so young, not that I was really bright or anything. It was just that my mom was a primary teacher. I was the youngest. And I seemingly cried every day. Uncle left me to go to school. Mm. So I wanted to go to school and it became easier for my parents to allow that. So then when I went through the system, the idea was that I would stay back. But eventually I went to university at the age of 16. So I was a child at university, really, for my first year particularly. But like for me, I suppose it's always been interesting stuff. But obviously for me, it has to be very much values, passion. I suppose I'm one of those people that believe that you can change the world. I mean, that's just it. Like, I've always believed I can change the world or we can change the world together. And my life reflects that. And so my work has taken me all over the world. I mean, I've worked in over 30 countries more, I would say. And I've always gone with that kind of belief that people have the power to change things. We just need to tap into that and use our skills and knowledge. And obviously, for me, things like integrity are fundamental to what I do. And also things like empathy and trust as well. So, so for me... It's kind of like, how can I help? And also if I can get interested in something so I could go through 50 different subjects and I pick on something then and then you won't see me for a while because I'm going to just go so deep into that. And I suppose that's what's happened with my career, really. Um, over the years, I've just gone in really deep in subjects, become expert globally on it. Mm. And then I eventually I'll probably go, I want to do something else. And so I do tend to shift around, but, but they're always the same basis. It's always values driven. It's always about making the, the world a better place for everyone. It's always about social justice, equality, sustainability. They're all, they're consistent themes, but how I approach it will be different. There's a, I mean, there's a conflict and there's an argument around idealism versus pragmatism, mm. right? What, what would your perspective be there? You had an idealistic, what would, this sounds like an idealistic, it's steeped in nature, childhood and, and community. Um, but pragmatism also is very, very, we've got to be pr pragmatic as a society. What would you, what would your perspective? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And look, I suppose the pragmatism would have come a lot from my family and stuff, you know, mm. I mean, I am the one who's the, I'm the outlier in my family. You know, I'm the one who sort of stepped out of the norms and started challenging things from a very young age, you know, so wherever I went, I said, so, and I can see you, you know, there's a balance required all the time. You need people like me to be idealistic, to, to be pushing the boundaries, to do things differently. But you also need people to kind of come in and go, OK, we can only go so far at this stage. So, mm. yeah, no, it's always been a balance. I just have felt comfortable from the start, I think, fairly early on, particularly when I found a bit more of who I was, which kind of happened a bit in school to a certain extent, because I tended to stand up and be who I wanted to be and obviously got into trouble a lot. But also it happened in university where I kind of stood out from everyone else for a while. And again, it happened when I won my first job in industry. So I kind of realized over time that I was happy to be the outsider. Mm. Like, and it's not like, you know, I didn't have friends and stuff, but I was usually the person who was trying something differently. Like I would have become vegetarian in Ireland back in the 90s. Mm. where. Like, no one was uh, vegetarian. No one was vegetarian. And so everyone thought you were crazy. Like, uh, you know, I was the one who shaved my head when no one else shaved their head. I was the one who did all these sort of things that, you know, who sort of dressed differently. I, I suppose I was just trying to find who I was. But also I kind of wanted to maybe shock people a bit as well. But also really a lot of it was for me to find out who I was and what I was about. And I suppose I did, while it was idyllic my, my growing up, it was very conservative. 
you know, mm. you know, like, you know, it was a typical Irish background, you know, growing up in a Catholic environment, you know, strong community. And uh, and we we didn't have a lot. I mean, you know, I know we all said as we get older, we grew up in set of, but we didn't. No, my parents mm. didn't have much. That was the reality. They didn't have an awful lot. But we were never short of everything and anything, you know. And I think the community provided so much. So like when I've gone forward in my work, I've always tried to understand what the community means for that. And you're right, that kind of, you have your idealism, your pragmatism, you know, there's this, you you know, you have your realists and stuff. But for me, it's about like, I mean, it is about working together, but also I suppose I have realized as my career has gone on that you, I think you need people like me who are willing to kind of step out, who are actually aren't always very popular. I've been very unpopular at various stages with lots of people, you know, but I can see myself the impact that's had. Mm. But, you know, you have to take people out of the comfort zone and, um, you know, I'm actually a very quiet person, yet sometimes people see me as being very provocative, very outspoken. But actually, if you met me on a day to day basis, I'm actually just a quite normal person. But I suppose I'm driven by this desire and passion to make the world better. And I get so upset and frustrated when I see inequality and social injustice. When I see people struggling on the streets, it upsets me no end. At the weekend, now, Jude, my, my partner Jude and I went into a uh, meet with some direct provision centre, um, some some people in the, the residence uh, in Cork over the weekend to try and help with a few issues. And that really upsets me to see a lot of those being traumatised by a system that's inhumane. Mm. They're being institutionalised. And I, so for me, you know, I just, just I just I can't stand that. And, and I, I suppose that comes very much from my parents. Like my dad also was a, he, he kept his community stuff on a local level. So my dad never really moved that much from a 15 mile radius. But everyone, everyone knew my dad. Because when I grew up, like my dad used to, during the week, right, my dad, like he's trying to make his go as a business, as, as a builder. But he'd spend quite a few nights every week going around to elderly people in the local community. And I'd go with him. He'd be making, he'd be giving him cups of tea. He'd be shaving the elderly man. He'd be doing whatever, repairing it. You know, and that's what I grew up with. You help people who need that help. And uh, and like before that, his dad as well. So his dad had set up the local uh, JA. He'd set up the local uh, cooperatives. He'd been in flying columns. My grandfather was in the flying columns back in the day. So you can see I grew up with this really strong sense of identity, community and stuff. And I suppose that's come with me. But what I've done is I've taken what I've learned from my parents and learned from my grandparents, even though I never met my granddad. I mean, he's kind of one of my idols. But I've taken what I can from hearing stories about those and said, OK, mine's more of a world stage. You know, I'm not going to do it locally. I, I had to go away from home. I mean, Mm. I didn't realize at the time, but I really needed to go away. And that's why I moved away in 1995. But, you know, I also took with me those things and said, OK, what can I do around design as it happens? My chosen career on sustainability, around a certain economy. What can I do to make a contribution like my dad and mom made and my grandparents made as well? What is that contribution? And that's where I've been seeking. And that's where I suppose my life has taken me like I said, literally all over the world, meeting all kinds of people, working all kinds of projects, but always fundamentally, can I help? And if I can't help, okay, I'm, I'm not going to waste my time. Doing, I'm the kind of person who'd say, I'm not the right person, you know? And I suppose for me, what makes me unusual in my career as well is that um, it's not necessarily, I'm not advising people to go this direction, but I've never been into money. Never. I mean, so from a young age, uh, right through to now. So, a career like mine, in theory, you should be making a lot of money. But I actually never wanted to make money. What I wanted to do, idealistically, was change the world. That's what I wanted. Would you, um, is there a sense of anti-capitalism there? There is, definitely. But like, it just, look, to me, the current system of capitalism doesn't work. You know, we rely on the market. To me, and I've argued this for years, I mean, I've worked, like I said, on policy development, I've been working on policy with governments all over the world for over 20 years. And so, and I've been advisors to ministers and I've met with heads of state. So like I've been there at the top arguing from a kind of idealistic perspective, what we can change stuff. It doesn't work for so many people. So yes, there is an anti-capitalist stuff there. You know, I'm not saying that we have to change every aspect of it, but I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the work of David Graeber. I don't know if you know heard of David Graeber. He was one of like people I really respected. I basically came across his work back in about, I suppose, 2010 or 11. I can't remember exactly. And the first time I heard him speak, I was like, wow, that's it. He spoke about a term called bullshit jobs. 
Uh, that was one of his kind of. I, suppose, I think I saw an article about that. Yeah, yeah, really, really, yeah. really interesting. But I could relate to when I, when I heard him speak about budget jobs, I was like, okay, I know where this is. I've been working now with governments and academias and NGOs and all these for quite a while at that stage. Is like, yeah, and I think for me. He, he always makes the point, and not just him. I mean, a lot of the readings and stuff that I would have been influenced were, were the 60s and 70s, you know. So there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel. In my career, since I started out in the 80s to where we are now, the mm. wheel keeps being reinvented. Now, David Graeber talks a lot about we built the current system, mm. we can unbuild it, and we can build a new system again. Sadly, David died a couple of years ago during the COVID years. But basically, so and I think the same. Look, there'll be elements that we take on again, you know, mm. we obviously need medicine to survive and we need environments. So there's a lot of good things that have come out. But why have we lost so many people in the way? If you look at Ireland as a, as a kind of a micro view in terms of globally, we have four or five people who have basically most of the wealth in Ireland. Mm. You know, and people can say, well done to all those people and they've done walked hard and stuff. But I don't think it's quite that straightforward. And I think for me, you know, and yeah, there's the idealism coming through, but no, capitalism doesn't work. I've ar argued for 20 years now, I've written on a policy level, I've produced policy papers for government stuff. It's always been, it's a systems failure. We can't just rely on the market. We need to have different strategies. And you can apply that straight away when you look at things like housing in Ireland. If the market is so successful, why are so many people struggling? And that's yeah. just one example. So yeah, so for me, we do need a new type of uh, of way of working, and yes, that requires a global change. And I suppose um, we we're we're a long way from that at the moment. And I suppose we see at the moment, don't we? We see it with our climate crisis. We can't ignore that anymore. We see it with our resource crisis. You know, that's where I started I, in 1989. I was a, probably the first person in Ireland to write about this. I wrote about it in my thesis and my degree that we needed to have a closed loop circular economy. So mm. when I wrote that, I was, look, I was 20 years of age, you know, <laughs> and I didn't, I mean, like I was naive. I didn't know what I was writing, really. All I knew that I'd spent, okay, so go back to me. I was, so I struggled in college. I got on grand, but I really wasn't that majorly enthused. And then in 1988, I was supposed to come up with a final year project. And I just couldn't, I couldn't be like, I was like, why should I design and make something? We already have what we need and couldn't really get into it. Everyone else in my class, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. I was the outlier. So the, the, the university said, can you speak to a different department? There's a chemistry lecturer and he'd like to speak to some design students. So I said, great. So I met a guy, his name is Dr. Peter Childs. And he asked me a question no one had asked before. He said, what happens to all these products when they come to into life? Mm. Are they recycled? All these materials. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. They're not, are they? So, so I changed from a student who was a little, I was doing well. I mean, I was getting good grades, but I wasn't really in it. Mm. And so I spent my summer holidays that year traveling around Ireland, obsessed with these questions that he sent me. And I came back to my final year. Instead of doing what I should have been doing, which was a lot of the other modules, I got obsessed with this particular thing. So I ended up, but the college hadn't seen it before. I ended up writing a thesis. You were supposed to make something and write about the make. But what did I do instead? I ignored the rules. I wrote this crazy thesis about what we needed to do in terms of recycling, recovery materials. And of course, that became the foundation for me moving forward. No, it was well received, but obviously wasn't what they were particularly looking for. But for me, it was that spark. And I suppose from there, then I've gone on since then. So that was looking at my dad was in construction, so I'd worked in construction. Mm. My dad is a kid and teenager and then gone in here and started to understand that we are in an issue where our planet, finite resources, we're not recycling. Look, in, in the 80s, Connor, I mean, we were throwing away so many computers back then, you wouldn't believe it. Mm. Like, so that's a long time ago. People probably think now a lot of the younger people now probably think we didn't even have a computer back then. That was the big issue. Electronic waste was piling up. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I ended up then working in the recycling industry for a while, uh, recovering silver, precious metals and stuff, and uh, taking computers apart up in an attic of a factory back in 1989 in the loft of a factory. But, yeah, so I started to kind of really get interested in that. And then that's where it's sort of, I suppose, it's taken off from there. But it's kind of this interest, like, I'd worked construction. My dad didn't like waste. Yeah, just didn't like waste. Look, we, he didn't have a whole lot. His clients didn't have a whole lot. 
Dad mm. was always trying to save his clients' money as well because they were local people who were trying to maybe have a small little house and they wanted to build on a toilet. And Dad would try and help him get funding for it and he'd do a really good job. And he was always going back and doing extra work and stuff, you know. Uh, but you know, and he, he had this mentality, he didn't throw things away. Like, so I kind of grew up with that, and my mm. mom as well. And then realized that we were throwing away so much stuff. And back in 1988, 89, I was like, Mom, God. So I kind of didn't decide there and then. I went back and did a master's and I started to do design. So I decided to do more about how we design stuff. So I focused on design for manufacturing assembly. Mm. Again, didn't do what the university wanted me to do again. I got interested in a different aspect and I kind of wrote up much more of a design led approach to it rather than they wanted me to kind of do like the automation, the robotics, but it just didn't interest me. I can't do stuff. It doesn't interest me. It mm. couldn't, get, couldn't ignite my passion. My passion has to be ignited. So I ended up then from there working, writing, the, looking at how stuff goes together and how stuff goes apart and then working in a Japanese company for four years and being the first person to bring in this kind of way of thinking into the Japanese company. So I sort of bought in this idea that eco design, recycling, design for environment. There were terms that were emerging across the planet at that stage, you know, um, and we were like, I was, it was a global Japanese company. We had bases in America, obviously Japan, Ireland, other places as well. So I started pushing for recyclability, uh, product design for assembly and all that kind of stuff. And during that time, we sort of began to lead the way in certain terms of product stuff. And I suppose, I got so far, I was moving up within the company, I had a great relationship with all the senior people, and I said, okay, I need to go now. And I decided I had to basically become an expert in the field. I wanted to be the person who knew everything about the subject. Mm. And the only way I could do that was I fell a lot by staying in the industry because they were pulling me into senior positions and it, wouldn't, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wanted to basically, so I, I decided to move to the UK, sell at the time, I suppose anything like, you know, I got rid of a car, I was, you know, I, I haven't really owned cars as much since then. Sold my car, which I needed for going to work and saved up, packed up all my stuff and I went to the UK. And I started in that autumn, a self-funded PhD, which I didn't, I funded for five years part time. And I basically uh, looked at systems, mm. design, life cycles, material flows and the role of different actors. And in my, in my PhD, I was awarded a PhD five years later. And in parallel, I also set up the first, uh, some of the first programs ever at university for for, uh, for students in the field. And also I became the, one of the first ever lecturers globally to be given the title of an eco-design lecture. And also did commercial work with a lot of different clients to fund myself. So exciting times for me. I was working with students. They were coming out as with the skills. But this is back in the 90s. This sounds like a story I tell you now. It sounds like a story of the last few years. I'm hearing these stories now from, from people working and they think it's amazing. The students are now getting interest in the field. So I was doing this back in the 90s. But uh, again, because I'm outspoken. You're a pioneer. Pretty yeah, I, yeah there, that's definitely a pioneer. Like there was a group and look, I was part of a pioneering group of researchers really in the UK and globally. We set up a group. I didn't set it up. I joined it called Eco2. I joined it quite early on. So they set up in 94, 95 and I joined it when I moved to UK in 95. And there was, mm. there was people like me. Well, actually, everyone was different. A lot of them were, were far more academic. Uh, they weren't coming from industry, but I came from industry and I came from a very practical background. But we were all interested in what can you do in terms of resources design? Yeah, so we were a pioneers by no, absolutely. And um, so, but, but of course, for me, what happened was I wanted to put the students in it first. Uh, I must say the university and I had a lot of clashes. So eventually I left, even though I could have stayed on as a lecturer, I, I walked out the door and started fresh again in zero zero. And that was what, where I kind of decided I didn't want to become an academic. I mean, I published loads already. I still have published lots of stuff. I just I just can't see the point. I will publish stuff at times academia because sometimes people want me to get involved with stuff. But um, mm. I found like, like I probably published for a self-funded PhD, I probably published more than most people, but like no one's reading the publications. And, and I was like, why would I waste my time spending weeks and weeks and weeks writing a publication no one's going to write? And I, I, I'm not doing it for my ego. I don't care how many publications mm. I have. I want to make change happen. So I decided to let my PhD and uh, no one would hire me anyway. Who's going to hire someone who was coming out? The skills I had in the world back in 2000, so no one was interested, which was good because actually what happened was I got a few jobs to kind of 
do like small little projects and I'd set up my own consultancy kind of in parallel. But then I suppose after doing this about a year's work of working with different people, uh, the government took me on as a kind of experiment. So that it was the in the UK at the time, it was the Welsh government. And they took me on. They'd seen me speak. They saw my passion. They knew I had a practical background. And the idea for me was to go in and help businesses. So to help businesses start thinking about sustainability, about systems, about materials. So that's 20 mm. years ago, 22 years ago, I started there. And I'm in there, normal job, government advisor, but again, I kind of took a totally different approach to everyone else. So when before I got the job, some of the professors, because it was linked with the university, linked with the government, they didn't want to hire me because they, they saw me being a bit, I think, difficult. And um, so they said a challenge. I'll give you an idea, Home. Like, so they said to me, there's no way you're going to make targets of 150 companies a year. So what did I do? My first year, I made... I think the first year was 300 or 450 and the following year, something like similar as well. So basically I, I made enough targets for the whole organization in my first couple of years and said like, no, you know, that's kind of like, well, I'm going to show you, I can do this. Why do you think they didn't think the 150 number was achievable? Uh, I think they just thought I was, I just know they didn't trust me. I'd come from a different institution. I suppose I was outspoken and I, I just think that um, they totally underestimated that I was very, very driven and, mm. I wanted to change things. So I ended up sort of basically doing their targets, doing the day work, but also having a second job in parallel. And my second job was I wanted to change the world and I wasn't going to do it by working directly with companies. So in parallel, I started uh, putting together proposals, lobbying government people. I visited every department in the government, right? Every department. In and Wales. Because I was, yeah. And I also started linking the UK as well, but initially in Wales. And now, I was a government advisor, so I, I, it was easier for me to open some of the doors. But literally, I met with everyone from like education, health, you know, uh, economy, transport, you name it. And I basically went to everyone and said, I've got a vision. This is what we, what we can do in Wales. And I kept doing this in parallel, writing proposals. And by within two or three years, all the government people started to take notice. And eventually we started to have meetings. And eventually they gave me 26,000 sterling. And that was back in... 2004 and that was for me to do some more research into this vision I was trying to set out because basically what I was trying to do at the time was I wanted Wales to take the opportunity to be the first country in the world to lead on eco design to become a nation that really invests on sustainable design mm. so that 26,000 led to another probably 44 another 44 and eventually within a year they said they're going to back me fully so I got three quarters of a million from the government Back in 2006, I set up my own organization uh, to um, basically deliver on this vision and then set up a stakeholder group to work with them and hired a team of people. And over the next seven years, we we became, yeah, we were in the top five globally for our work. We were recognized. We're still recognized by a lot of, so a lot of, um, we were named by loads of governments in the top five in the world. I became an advisor to UN, the European Commission. We started, we took a program of capacity building. So I'll go back to community. And my idea was build capacity. Mm. The idea was if you're my client and, and as us as an organization, we were called the Eco Design Center. If we went into you and you're our client, my objective was to get you to stop hiring us as soon as possible. Not that we would piss you off, mm. but we would give you what you needed, the skills, the knowledge, the tools that you wouldn't have to come back to us. And if you came back to us, it's because you want to innovate at a different level. Mm. He wanted to go much further. I didn't want to come back for the same projects over and over again. All our competitors were taking a totally different strategy. So we started to win business with clients that said, you're the first person who's come to us with that type of approach because everyone else wants to create a dependency. My mm. idea, again, is very idealistic. So I like, like, like there's great results behind our idealism, but I do realize it's very idealistic. But my idea was that, yeah, if we can build capacity, build competencies, build skills, People can do it for themselves. Give a man a fish. You know this. You know the saying. Mm. We can get them through themselves. I can then focus my energy and efforts on my team, on the next client, on the next client. So we started doing like major kind of demonstration projects, working with groups of companies, groups of universities, changing how they taught, changing how the companies design products. We did. We became the first organization at the time to be officially a member of the government policy teams, and never had done that before. And like any back then, like Karen, I was like. I was like kind of punky, so I like spiked hair, long beards. Like I was like <laughs> dressing alternative. So they were bringing this people, this person 
and to this meeting with suits to all these people. And I was the only one st standing out. And it was yeah. all about, it was passion, enthusiasm, but also it was based on knowledge and, and results. And I suppose I did that for seven years. And then in 2013, when we were, I suppose, the height of success, we had like projects all over the world. I made a decision to uh, walk out the door. What so, was the decision based on? Um, I felt I needed to, I, I, again, I needed a new approach. I just needed something new. Like this was working, it was doing okay, but I was frustrated. I just wanted to do more. And I wanted my, I wanted to, see what happened was, it started off, I was doing a lot of the work directly with the clients and stuff. But obviously as the business grew, I mean, we were only eight or 10 people, but like as it grew, like we were collaborating more and more people. Like there was all, I was always being called to see in our meetings. I was always being asked to go to speak people. So I was traveling a lot, which was great for a while. I mean, don't get me mm. wrong. Uh, always talking at events, always sitting in board meetings, steering meetings, blah, blah, blah. And I was kind of losing interest, in, if you like, in my in my passion. But mm. also because we were so successful, uh, we were we started out like as a kind of spin off from a university with government funding. But then as we grew, the university um just kind of wanted to, we agreed from the outset that we pay 20% of everything we, we make to the university. And for that service, they would give us uh, kind of HR, uh, the kind of, I suppose, maybe a bit of an men, small bits, but not much. But it was really kind of, I suppose, it was a stamp for any of our clients to say that we have a university behind us if we ever needed it. Now, we mm. never really used it. We gave them 20% for years and years. But then they started to take more and they started to take more. And they started to make it more difficult for us to recruit people. And it started more difficult for me to, to develop new projects. So my hands were being tied more because basically what they wanted to do was they wanted us to come back on campus. They wanted us to go on campus and become part of an institute. And I was never going to do that. So, so for me, I suppose I was to a certain extent, you're kind of pushed into decision. But also I was also I was getting a bit like just disillusioned, really. I suppose I'd set out, I'd left Ireland in 95 with this kind of I wanted to become a sex expert. I'd done my PhD. I'd worked with all these kind of companies, done the kind of advisory service for some years, met 100 companies, supported them on a startup basis, then set up the center, which became like suddenly the top five globally, mm. who was like basic. We had no problem in the world attracting people to us. Like it was, everyone wanted to work with us at one stage. And uh, and then for me, it was just like, oh, if this, is this it? <laughs> is this it? Like, the, our resource crisis was getting worse. Our climate crisis was getting worse. All the things, our biodiversity crisis were getting worse. All the things that I set out to change the world and were getting worse. Now, we were getting the results. And like we won, at, you know, just before I left, actually, I went to Brussels to the European Parliament to pick up. I didn't know at the time, but I picked up this uh, World Green Design Award uh, for, the, for our work in terms of the model I'd set up and stuff. So it was a nice way to leave. But mm. I just had to get out. I felt like I was becoming, I'd become a workaholic too. To be honest, I was a serious workaholic at this stage. Uh, and now I get obsessed about stuff, but at this stage, I was just all the time. I never took a salary increase and all the time. Uh, you know, I just, I think it was, it was, I was just, I suppose I was insanely trying to change the world, building my teams, uh, putting a lot of time into my teams, a lot of time into my clients, but maybe not enough time into myself either, you know? And I think from, I, I realized uh, probably from a mental health point of view too, I just needed to look, take a step back. I'd achieved what I set out to achieve in many ways. I mean, we had done a lot of really good stuff, but globally the issues were getting worse. And mm. I really felt like if I stepped out, took a year out. So literally when I, when I left, I literally contacted every client. I had loads of kind of international roles. I contacted all my international roles. And I said, everyone's stepping out for well. And people were like, all right, okay. What's really interesting when you do that, you know, I didn't say I was stepping out forever. I said I was stepping out for like you know, a year or so. Mm. I lost, I lost all those context, contexts instantly. That was, I was, I was dead in the field after that. I, I didn't expect that. It was good though, but no one ever contacted me anymore. So you go from this kind of like innovator in the space to suddenly no one wants to know you. And, and I think I it think might that, be you're, you're not, you're not, you're now not useful. That's it. Oh, totally. No utility. That's oh, totally. Totally. Because when I was there, I was kind mm. of like we were working with like institutes like, I mean, you may not know them, but they're front off institute in Germany. They're big like researchers. I mean, they're, they're massive, right? They wanted to work with us all the time. Like we were seven or eight people in an office in Cardiff. And this institute 
which is massive, multi, multi, wants to work with you. We had all these big players globally wanted to work with us, you know, to be associated with us, to be associated with what I was doing and stuff on my team. And I think, but it was great for me because I walked out the door, right? And it was hard to say goodbye to my team because you build teams, I suppose that was probably my second or third build of teams. I was very close to them. Mm. And um, like I walked out and um, the following year, I literally um, basically just meditated uh, grew all my own food. I was already into going food. Uh, cooking, I basically learned cookery skills from globally. I became this crazy obsessed cook. Everyone had to come all the time for because I was cooking all all the time. Like I literally would be cooking all day, every day. Like I got you know, that's the kind of person I am. But I, I became a really good cook, meditating all the time. I started performing my poetry, which I've been writing for years, and uh, started doing a lot of stuff like making like gar- like sheds down the allotment and just. So it, it, it's a it's a complete lifestyle adjustment, lifestyle change. Uh, it was it was it was it was a lifestyle. Change. It was kind of stuff I was doing anyway, but no, it was like I, this is all I'm doing full time. And it was just amazing, like, and so for that year, I needed. I didn't realize the first few months I needed to break. My health was like I didn't mm. realize. You stop. You're going a hundred miles an hour, like you can see mm. the way I talk. That's the way I am when I'm working. See a hundred miles an hour for so long, and you stop, and you stop, and the phone stops ringing, and you stop ringing the phone. I had hundreds of emails every day back in the prime, hundreds and hundreds of emails. I was the kind of person, if you email me, Connor, I'd make sure I got back to you that night. Even though I'd stay up late to do it. Because you know, if you needed something, I, was, I wasn't going to let you down because my dad and mom instilled that kind of mentality. So I just walk ethic, which was too much really looking back on it. Like, because, you know, it was like, literally, I won't let Connor down, so I'll get back to you. So, so literally, um, stopping everything was amazing. And then just like at the end of all that, um, I suppose um, on a personal basis, uh, the following January, uh, out of the blue, right? And I won't go on about this too much. My wife announced that she was leaving. Out of the blue. So I'd gone through this work stuff. Mm. Uh, and everything was grand in the marriage. And it seems to be. It was only the last few months, she said, like in hindsight. But that was grand. So I'd kind of gone from this kind of career guy to this chilled out guy who'd be home all the time cooking and all this kind of stuff. And then like in January, she said she'd met someone else and she was leaving just like that. So like my life had been turned upside down by leaving this career I'd built in an innovative space, like being recognized globally for it, to suddenly be going, oh, okay, our family home, everything. And I'm now, and also like I said, I wasn't really working. I was doing the odd job, but I literally was just kind of uh, trying to find, I was writing a lot and all that kind of stuff. And um, so, yeah, so that was amazing. Cause when she said she was leaving, what I did was um, thought about it during the day. She announced in the morning and I, test, I messaged her during the day, said, look, don't worry come back this evening, we'll have a chat. And I gave her a big hug and said, look, it's going to be okay. I wish you the best, you know? And um, Frank, do you think there was a correlation between your life choice, that massive lifestyle change and marriage breakup? Yeah, possibly. Possibly. I think for, uh, looking back, um, my ex Sally, I think she was probably climbing. She was beginning, getting more into career and I was probably getting a bit more like she Out was of... getting more into it. So she mm. was in, in a university and she was doing some really good work and she's a lovely person. And I think she was getting more into that and I was getting more critical. Mm. I was getting more critical of the institutes. I was seeing where their failings were. And I think that definitely wouldn't help. And so she sort of, so yeah, maybe, but look, it worked out amazing because the best thing I ever did was to accept it straight away. Most people, like my friends, they hang on to these things for years and they're miserable. I just mm. accepted it. Of course, it was tough. It was tough and hard too. Like we had a brilliant time together when we were together. Like we were together for I don't know, I remember, fifteen, sixteen years. So we had a great time. Mm. So I said, like, we, and like I think for her too, she wasn't expecting that. It was good for her. It was good for me. And as it happens, I wouldn't have met my new partner Jude if I didn't have that attitude. And so like, so now I have an amazing life with Jude. But it just shows that like, I suppose it's how you approach things. I'm the kind of person I suppose who I do take things personal and I do get very emotional. Like it's in my my dad was the same, but also I accept that things change. Mm. You know, I accept that life goes on and it's how you make the most of it. And that kind of person goes, well, look, you know, you know I'm a fighter, I suppose. Like I mean, Jude, my partner, she said, I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter in, in terms of like you get one chance in life, Connor, one chance. And you you have to grab it. And I know it's we have hard days and I have hard days. Same as you. Everyone's got tough days. But also I'm so privileged. And I knew that time when my marriage broke up 
that I still had the privilege. Yes, it was hard to go through a breakup. Actually, my dog, who was my baby, he died a few months later. And that was much harder, to be honest, much harder. And then to sell the house and get rid of all my possessions, which was my choice. I decided, look, fresh start. Mm. We said reduce everything down to the box. But that was all kind of, you know, I suppose it makes you stronger. And I suppose during that time, I wrote a lot. I performed a lot of poetry, a lot of very personal stuff, um, which shocked a lot of the audiences. But it was a way for me to get my emotions out onto the public domain so I could then move on and focus mm. on the next thing, you know. And the next thing, as I said, like Jude, my partner, you know, Jude Cherry, um, and we've, she was working with me. She was uh, operations manager for my previous organization. So we'd known each other anyway. And when we got together, we didn't expect it because we were collaborating on some projects and we ended up getting together over time. And it's it's been amazing because she's just been amazing. And it's been just this like, it's amazing timing for both of us because we just, it's like it was meant to happen. We've come together. We're both a similar type driven passion for justice, equality, sustainability. We both look at the world totally differently at the same time. So I'm on the ADHD side. She's more like on the autistic side. So we have very different ways of, so we'll mm. often chat to each other and not really understand what the person's saying, really. And that's been a big learning curve for us over the last number of years is trying to understand each other. But together, we've ended up doing some of the best work of our life. You know, that's the thing, you know, and that's the beauty. Like we have a brilliant relationship on a personal level, but we also work together. And I suppose... I think yeah, it's timey at times, you know. Frank, does um does dereliction affect you personally and emotionally? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, so Jude and I moved. Uh, we moved the time from from to the UK to the Netherlands, and then we came back to Cork in Ireland in late twenty eighteen. And so mm. we came back with a very. We both have similar resources, product, urban environments, and we came back to Cork with this idea that. We would take what we were we were innovating in Amsterdam. We were trying out new business models. So mm. we came back to Ireland looking at circular cities and business models. So businesses that operate in like a 5K radius and stuff. So all resources when the city that wasted are reused back in. So we developed really interesting stuff, Jude and I. Came back here with this idea. We'd come to Cork, try these things out in Ireland. We moved back mostly because of family. We both wanted to be close to our parents and stuff, you know, and that particular time where, the, where they were and stuff. And so we didn't expect to end up and dereliction. But when we came back here and saw the dereliction and the vacancy, the King heritage, the housing crisis, the homeless crisis, the catalogue of stuff was going on. We got so emotionally involved very early on, you know, and we sort of, I suppose we always walk up environments, we always take pictures. So when we travel together, we, we normally slow travel, usually ferries and trains if possible. And we do a lot of urban exploring. We take photographs, we map things out and we do this very simple model called West Play Walk. Rest, everyone should have a home, play, adults and kids should have access to creative play spaces and work, just meaningful work. So we were applying this kind of framework in Cork. But what we were seeing instantly that there's no point us focusing on the work element, which is what we thought we'd do. We mm. really need to focus on the rest and the play. There was a serious lack of, of homes and there was a serious lack of creative spaces as well. But yet we were surrounded by this epidemic of vacancy dereliction. It affects your mental health. It affects your community, it affects the economy, it affects tourism. But most of all, it stops people being traumatized if they have a home. A home is a fundamental basis for any of us. I grew up with a home with a roof over my head and a family that allowed me to become the person I am. And I'm seeing people, we were seeing people at the time. We were seeing kids go to school. We're, we're not too far from a school here. We were seeing kids go to school every day coming from a temporary accommodation, coming from somewhere where they couldn't have their own food in their rooms and stuff, and then arriving at school and the school fair play was trying to do their best for them. But they were passing derelict houses on the way. Where mm. we live here, on the bottom of our street, there's two derelict houses. There's another vacant house next to us, and there's another one just across the road, up a small bit. So, yeah, no, so it affects us. It really it was something that, like, so we did 18 months of research initially, again, Equally, uh, Jude was doing some other projects at the time, mostly. I was doing some as well, but I had a bit more time, so I jumped into the whole thing. So the next 18 months, I immersed myself in Ireland, the culture, society, read as many papers, websites as possible, but particularly focused on housing, homeless, all this stuff. And what I realised with Jude as we went through it was dereliction was an area that wasn't just no one was talking about. 
and it was normalized. We chatted to people and they go, Oh, that's the way things are, Frank. Just can't do anything about that. And it's like, okay, that's like a was it a rag to bull, whatever to me is like, of course we can. I hate that. Of course we can do something about it. Well, so, it wouldn't uh, be tolerated in Amsterdam. It wouldn't oh, be tolerated all. in Berlin. I, I spent a lot of time in Berlin. It just isn't for some reason there is something in the Irish consciousness that seems to tolerate this stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's it. And and like so that's what we wanted to say. Well, okay, you don't it doesn't have to be this way. So in June 2020, actually, we're just coming up, actually, it happened. So this is our third year anniversary of starting the campaign. So it's good, good time for chatting too. Um so we started on the 24th of June uh 2020 posted our first tweet and that became the foundation then every day for a whole year we posted a different property in the city city within a two kilometer radius of the center to mm. say this is derelict this is not being used this is a broke down a social contract with housing crisis so we started bringing in the heritage the housing the homelessness the, the economy the environment the mental health. So Jude and I started introducing a load of conversations through the thread of of every day. And in parallel, uh, Jude's more of a data person than me. I'm the one who sort of, I suppose, does a lot of the kind of public rant provocations stuff. And so she's mm. in parallel went through the publicly available data for 340 properties. So we found 700 within two kilometers. Yeah. Uh, we did a report called This is Dark Darling, which Jude analyzed the data based on 340. And over the year, we shared about 450. So the council at the time, the local authorities were reporting on 95 and they were at a much wider radius. So, mm. so like literally, that was something that wasn't right. So literally, started the thread, started doing the research. And once the media picked up on it, now we didn't know anyone. We didn't really, we weren't Twitter experts by any stretch of imagination. In fact, I didn't ever look at the analytics till way later than that. And I didn't realize, because a few months later, quite a few months later, maybe the end of the year, I realized that my Twitter was gone crazy because people weren't liking, they weren't retweeting necessarily, but they were all coming. Mm. And what we realized was all the journalists were coming to my Twitter feed, all the architects, the heritage, the local authorities, they were all viewing. They weren't necessarily reacting, but they were viewing. So Frank, can I ask you, is, are you saying up to 700 houses within a two kilometer radius of the city center of Cork? Yeah. How broad... Are we a radius are we talking about here mm. for those 700? Yeah, so they're all within two kilometers. So if you take the city centre, we were basically around, we'll say in Cork, there's like a like a well-known market and we were basically in the city centre called the English Market and we're mm. two kilometers. So go two kilometers from each from each of that or, or the centre island. So in Cork, there's an island. And so each direction go two kilometers. So that's kind of where we kept our research to. So we mm. always kind of like beyond that, we didn't think through properties and we focus on, you know, the idea was for us where we were interested in was like a livable city, a 15 minutes, all these terms. But ultimately, could like we we came back to Ireland, we don't have a car, we hire a car if we need it, we walk and cycle and get trains and buses. That's the kind of lifestyle that suits me and you. I know it doesn't suit everyone, but that's what suits us. So we were based on people like us. Other people we knew abroad who might move back to Ireland, who lived away, who like urban environments. And if they move back, they'd probably want to live within a couple of kilometers into city centre because they can go in for a few pints. They can mm. go in for a meal. They don't have to. Yeah, total convenience. So we were mm. thinking if you could, if you had 700 houses that were that convenient, that's 700 families or 700 groups of individuals mm. would then be back in the city. What a difference that would make to the local environment, the economy. Mm. You know, if you run a business, they could support it you could, for the schools. You know, for, you could then have a much better transport system. Uh, so, yeah, so that's what we were particularly interested in was like, can we turn this around? Can we, if there's that much empty, why are they empty? And so we started looking at the myths behind it and we started writing reports and we did like loads of other stuff and policy. And so there has been policy changes. There has been huge cultural changes. And, but it's all been around the idea of why are we wasting these things? Like why, but, 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 but why are we, Frank? What is if somebody owns a building in the city center in Cork? Why not repurpose it, improve it, rent it out, generate revenue, generate income? You think so? Yeah. What's stopping them? Is there's it speculation? Of, and, and how does that work? Like, what is in it for the business? Or the, the property? Yeah, there's a lot of reasons. But I suppose I'll give you an example for a small terrace house. What we found would go up every year in Cork £20,000 by doing nothing. So like the value of the property was going up 20,000 every year. So by actually not 
doing anything, your property value goes up anyway. So for a lot of them, it's easier not to do anything because- Would it, would not, would it not just go up more, 30% if you repurpose it and you're deriving the income? Yeah, but they don't have to make any investment at this stage. So they can just let it sit there. A lot of Could these like, be inherited properties? Properties that oh, were inherited? Oh, there, would be. there is. And we would have gone down, broke down stats. So you'd have a small percentage of fair deal, for example, which mm. is when someone goes into home. There'd be a small few of inherited, but there'd be a larger percentage- Really, like what we tended to do. No, we did the data for three forty. Well, due to the data for three forty, but what we didn't tend to do was basically um, uh, get too obsessed about any individual property. But mm. but yeah, there are individual cases. But when you break down the stats, probably they're only maybe ten fifteen percent of them. There's still an awful lot that are just sitting there. No, like like you said, some are speculation. Some are part of a potential what I call a dereliction wasteland. So you might have a street or a block. And there might be 50 or 60 percent of them vacant or derelict. And you can see that's kind of owned by different people who are speculating on the idea of more become vacant and then over time turn into development land. But there's also like like there's also a lack of enforcement. So, for example, if the local authorities, they have a dereliction sites uh, levy thing that they could be enforcing now since 1990. So, for example, mm. if you own a derelict property in Cox City, the council should be on to you, Connor. They should say to you, basically, Connor, your property's derelict. Mm. What are you going to do about it? We'll give you six months or 12 months. And you, okay, if you don't do anything, we're going to fine you. Now, the fine was 3%. Now it's 7%. So they could fine you 7% every year of its value. Now, Up that to total would, value in a single year. Yeah. So that would be an incentive for you to go, okay, I'm going to get these fines every year. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, I'm making 20,000 do nothing based on accumulated value of my property. But if I get the fine, maybe I'm better off to hire the contractor and mm. bring it back into use. Mm. So, but see, the council doesn't enforce the dereliction uh, levies. So they, they've just refused to do that now for decades. Why? Cultural. I mean, a lot of challenges here are cultural. So, I mean, obviously the relationship Irish people have with property, going back to John B. Keane's The Field, all that mm. stuff kind of comes up a lot. So it's my property. I can do what I want. There's that feeling. Uh, the council say that they haven't got the staff, it's too complicated, and they kind of take the side a lot of the owners. They say, oh, well, you know, it's too complicated, you know, we can't be putting them under pressure to do that. Whereas if if a council takes a more proactive approach, for example, mm. Limerick were very slow for years, but now Limerick in recent years have started implementing CPOs, which are compulsory purchase. So mm. in other words, your house, your properties, Connor, the council says, sorry, Connor, you're not paying the direction levies, you're leaving decay onto the street. They're a public health issue. They're an eyesore. All the things that go with that. They're a fire hazard. Well, fire hazard. I mean, fire hazard. There. I mean, the amount of crumbling buildings in Cork City, Connor. It's shocking. Honestly, we've only been back here not even five years yet. I've been following it's, your Twitter feed for a uh, while now, and it is absolutely shocking. It's shocking, Connor. There was a, a young woman killed in 1999. Her name was Eva Bell. She came back. She's from Ireland. She came back for Christmas. I'm not, not sure where she was living. And mm. she was walking down one of the main streets in Cork and a building fell on top of her. They, they described the time she was killed like she was like a rag doll. A really upsetting case. That building, that area of town is still mostly derelict. The amount of buildings, there was a crumbling building a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks before that. Uh, this year alone, I mean, because generally now, you and I, people message us and we, we go out and take pictures because obviously we've got a, I mean, that's the one thing what we've been doing. We've had brilliant support from the community. It's been amazing, not just in Cork, across the country. Now there are people sharing all across Ireland. There's groups set up. So there's a real, the community wants to change this. They know that we can do better. And we have seen some success. But if, if a local authority, like in Cork situation, it's a dereliction of duty. They are, they are not fulfilling the social contract. They are li literally, like, we joke about it, you and I, right? But we're also serious. There's parts of Cork, Connor, you should have a hard hat walking around. It is that bad in places. Now, people will say, oh, it's because it's built in a marsh and they're old buildings. Amsterdam is built in a marsh. Mm. They're old buildings. They mm. can maintain and look after them. They don't have dereliction. We lived in Amsterdam previously. There wasn't dereliction there. It's just not allowed. Now, they had their challenges in the 70s and 80s. People stood up and said no more. And they kept standing up and said no more. And eventually, the local authorities changed their policies and changed their practices. We could do the same here. Like Cork City and right, likewise, the towns and cities in Ireland right across the country. Beautiful towns. We have heritage architecture here that other countries don't have. We don't realise the 
how beautiful they are. I had to go away to come back with Jude and for us to go, oh my God, it's much nicer than we realize. Why are we vandalizing it? It's criminal behavior. You know, people are dying in the streets without a home. Dying in the streets without a home. Yet there's hundreds of homes in Cork City. People are living in inhumane conditions in direct provision. Mm -hmm. Travelers and their and their sites are getting ridiculous treatment. Yet we are surrounded by vacancy in our election. And I think it's it's criminal, really. It is really criminal. And like Cork City, like, yes, it's built in a marsh, but these buildings are not maintained. They're not looked after. I mean, in, in uh, the Netherlands, any building pre-World War II is considered very precious and mm -hmm. we look after it. We have buildings in Cork, 200, 250 and 300 years old being left up, like you said, for someone to light a match to them mm. or for someone to, to knock them down. Because going back to what your question was, why is it happening? In Cork, what's quite common, they'll let a lot of buildings rot and decay. They'll mm. remove the slates. They'll remove maybe a window or two, let the weathering come in. Then over time, they'll decay further and eventually it's going to be a reason for them to knock them down. So we're losing vital heritage. Now, her heritage is so important for our well-being. For us mm. since the place. Well, well we came... Malcolm Gladwell spoke about this, the broken windows concept. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a similar idea. It's the idea that behavior in the community will reflect the architecture in many ways, right? That if yeah. you allow it to go oh. to rack and room, people with antisocial behavior, crime, et cetera, et cetera, will, will go up um, because of it. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Well, that's, that's totally, that's totally it. Yeah. Um, you said something recently um, in, in an Irish Times article from September 22. Owners leave the properties to the K so they eventually might get permission to have them demolished. Mm. How prevalent and how ubiquitous is that? Is that something that's really genuinely yeah. happening? It's very much happening, Connor. I mean, it's very much happening. I mean, if you know, we, yeah, if you sometime you come to Cork and uh, Jude and I would be happy to take you for a walk around if you ever, if you're ever down here. And uh, I do. it is very common, like, and it's really disappointing. And there was, there's, for example, recently, um, there's a lovely old pub up in Shandon and mm. um, it's called Kehomani's. And because of our walk, Jude and I, we hear all the stories about the community stuff around it. But basically, that was left rot for decades, right? Mm. And then they got permission to to convert it to apartments. But they, what they did was they kind of demolished it all bar just one facade. So the, it's the half the front facade and they've left the rest of it. But that's heritage protection, according mm. to them. So heritage, there's no real value in heritage. And it's common for, like I said, is all around us here. There's so many properties where the slates have been removed, where the tiles have been removed. You know, and then of course, what happens as well? It's not just that the local authorities won't charge the seven percent levy. The local authorities won't even put buildings in Cork where the roof is missing. They won't even put those on the dereliction register. So the first stage is, I contact you, Connor, and say that's your property on on McCurtain Street. You've owned that, blah blah, and you have a conversation, right? Mm. Then I'd say to you, it's go on the dereliction register by the end of the year. If you don't do something about it, you don't do anything. I put it on the register. Then mm. I charge you 70 levy. In Cork, they won't, because the local authorities have said to us, oh, you know, it's so unfair in Connor. We don't want to be unfair in Connor. Like, you know, you know you're being too harsh. So you they think in a small community, there might be social consequences, right? So you've got people working in Cork mm. County Council, their neighbor owns that. Yeah. You know, and there's a little bit of, well, I don't want to upset the neighbors type of thing. I think there's that. I think that, you know, in, Cor I mean, in Ireland, we didn't realize I said being away for decades. I was away for 23 years and I came back. I forgot mm. how small Ireland is. Like, it's so small. I mean, mm. it's a village. I know mm. Ireland is a village. I mean, I suppose that's because I've walked everywhere where big places where it's like you don't know anyone. Like, mm. I lived in Cardiff for years. I never knew as many people as I already know in Cork, I know you and I have been out there uh, on the campaign, so people know us and they come up to us in the street and that like people thank us for what we do and stuff. So I know we're mm. kind of more visible than maybe I was before, but literally it's a village here. So yes, everyone knows everyone, and definitely that carries on. Or oh, we can do to them; they're a nice family. Or there's a lot of conversations too around. Oh, 
their, their, their family's been here for generations and stuff. So there definitely is a lot of the old money as well. And look, you know, they've given so much to the city and we can't come down hard on them, even though they might own a block of properties in the main part of the city. Like if you walk, like we're living, where Blackpool meets Shandon, that's where Jude and I live. If you mm. walk from our place through Shandon, down onto Shandon Street and into the kind of the heart of the city, that's the historic spine. If you go through the historic spine of Cork, so it's Shandon, it's Shandon Street, down onto North Main Street, South Main Street, and Barrack Street. It is just one block of dereliction after dereliction. Irish people or people who live in Ireland, when we go to other countries, we go to Paris and we go to Amsterdam and we go all to these places and we seek out the historic cores. We want to drink coffee there. We want to have our meals out and our glasses of wine. We want to take our photographs. In Cork, the historic core has been vandalised by the local authorities and property owners and whoever else for decades. It's embarrassing. Before COVID, friends of ours came over from the Netherlands, um, you know, and uh, we took them for a walk, Connor. It was embarrassing. Like, they came over from the Netherlands and we, you know, we were new to Cork at the time. We said we'd take them for a walk around. We were still getting to know the city ourselves. And they were like, why are you? We were explaining this is the historic quarter and this is the old butter exchange and this is the old warehouses and Dutch style because a lot of Dutch architecture now in Cork as it happens and uh, a lot of it being really, really destroyed at the moment. And uh, they were like, why are you doing this? Like they were like, and the Dutch are quite like, they're going back to the Dutch are very pragmatic. Like I would say, pragmatism, I didn't really know pragmatism until I went to the Netherlands. Fools. Yeah, and, and they, they are like, and they're like, they, like a lot of people go, they're really kind of into sustainability and stuff. They are and they aren't. They're actually into making pragmatic decisions. It makes sense for them financially. They don't want to have pollution and they don't want to have traffic everywhere. You know, that's why they walk and cycle a lot and they have good public transport. They want to move around. They know the economy. In the Netherlands, they know the economy works much better if everyone's got a home and we can all get to work easier and get home. They know that. Yeah, yeah. plus you have you have this extraordinary asset. Is what I'm hearing in Cork, right? Um, I don't know Cork. I've been down once or twice, and I look forward to going down and, and have, doing a tour. But you, not only do you have the heritage piece, you have this extraordinary asset that could be repurposed, rebuilt, regenerated. Um, everybody would feel better. What's stopping it? What I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, is inaction by local authorities, essentially due to. Uh, societal and community issues there is no reason if legislation's in place yeah that demands people act in this if it's not being enforced the only reason conceivable reason for that is the, the council is not being pressurized to enforce there are no consequences if you don't if there's no enforcement and then there's the social that's it. that's it that's it it's kind of like the social nurse you're only so yeah definitely cult- yeah. so for a big thing for us is being cultural like because I got 20 years experience of policy and I was involved in developing policy from the start with the ID in the UK and seeing it develop over four or five years and seeing the policy announced and then seeing 15 years later, the also often the policies I've been involved with aren't enforced. You come back here and go, no, because people go, oh, grand, it's, there's a policy in place for that. It's no good unless it's enforced. And like, so if the dereliction stuff was enforced and compulsory portraits, now Jude and I have developed a toolbox. I mean, other people have as well, but like we, our toolbox would also include compulsory sales, compulsory rental, a much more proactive approach to meanwhile use. You know, uh, I'd like to look at meanwhile use, not just for in terms of creative community space. I'd like to look at meanwhile housing. So which is a kind of a form of squatting. We've also advocated for squatting. So we have basically said, there is so many other ways around this. And if you're not going to enforce your dereliction laws, and I think you made a point over Malcolm Gladwell, it's so true. They'll go on about someone throwing a can of empty can on the street, which I obviously does frustrate me. But yet a property owner can let his property crumble onto the street and not be fined at all. If you're homeless in Cork, right, and we've been fortunate enough to have really nice conversations with a lot of people who sadly have struggled to get a home, if you go into a shop and steal a bar of chocolate because you're really hungry and it's a 50 pence bar of chocolate, mm. the law will come down on you, Connor, mm. and you will get a hard time. You're a property owner with five or six properties or even just two or three or whatever in the city. You can get away with what I would consider criminal behavior. You know, we should not. 
Look, the mental health alone, our children, our younger generation should not be walking down streets and seeing this decay into our election. What does it tell them? And if they're coming from a homeless shelter or a temporary accommodation, what does it tell them? So there's a trauma. It does affect you. It does affect your mental health. And actually, the Scottish have done some wonderful research on that. They have shown that there's a huge impact on mental health. And so our heritage is priceless. Once those buildings go, we, we can build them again. No, it's it's so we're losing. Like, where's the win? Where mm. is the win for society and culture with their election? Who's winning here? Mm. Look, the support we've got is amazing. Like locally, nationally, internationally, we've actually had like, like we've gone out in the countryside and people have come up to us. So I I was a bit nervous the countryside. I suppose in some ways how people react because uh, speaking up like we do and stuff and standing up in the crowd. But like we've had all kinds of people of all kinds of ages saying thank you. Thank you for trying to change this. My son, my daughter, my neighbor, they're struggling to get a place. You know, you know, my daughter's had to immigrate. My son, so we've all these stories like and they, and the people, I suppose one of the great feedbacks we've had is that people say things like, I, I, I've started to see it and I can't unsee it anymore. You, you, you've got us to look up. You made us look up and mm-hmm. now we've looked up. All we see is it. And like they're also kind of going, oh, for God's sake, why did you do this? Because it's depressing. But they're also saying thank you because we just forgot. We just didn't realize it. It was normalized. It mm. was normalized. It was lit when some of their earlier, we had some great support from the media. Now we've had to contact none of the media. They've all come to us. But we had the odd, now most people have been brilliantly supportive. But we've had the odd journalists going, kind of, what are you doing this for? And, you know, there's nothing wrong at all. This is grand and this is the way things are. And why are you, why are you caught? And there's just a few people. And also other people, in particular in the first six months, we had people contacting us, asking us to stop. Or oh, we were showing a sit in a bad light and we were, you know what I mean? It was, oh, well done, you've done your bit now, but, you know, you know, stop now at this stage. And it's like, well, you know, how can you stop? Like, I mean, I, I said, like, that we were very lucky. We met a guy called Jimmy uh, early on. He was without a home, same age as me, actually, uh, early 50s. Unfortunate circumstances, actually, like me, he went to a marriage breakup, right? Mm. I was okay, thankfully. He wasn't. He ended up on the streets. He ended up in a tent. Jude and I used to meet him a couple of days a week. Oh, my God, what a lovely man. Inspiring. Attitude was amazing. He was such a positive thinker. If he could write those books behind me, he'd write the most amazing book. He was so positive, yet he was in such dark condition, you know? And like from people like him, he he allowed us to understand what it was like from his perspective and for other people. So he was feeding us back stories about the homeless shelters and what was happening and how difficult it was for people like him to get back in there and stuff, you know. Mm. So people like that you meet and you go, how can he be so positive and believe that it will get better, you know? And then you meet someone else and go, oh, this is where things are. And you're like, hang on a second. That guy's struggling mm. in the tent and he's getting up every morning if he's lucky, he can find somewhere, you know, because he was robbed a lot of times and attacked and stuff. Because that's the thing. A lot of people who are actually living in these conditions, they get a lot of hassle from people, you know. So well, they're well, they're vulnerable um, and they're easily identifiable. Very much so, yeah. So yeah. drunk people who want to act out yeah. can identify them immediately, see they're vulnerable. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about the housing crisis, right? So hypothetically speaking. You've worked a lot with government agencies, et cetera. Say Leo rings you up tomorrow morning, right? And says, Frank, good news. I'm putting you in charge of housing. You have 12 months. Where would you start? Well, I suppose at the moment we have the surplus for the, you know, from the, from the tax. I mean, we have the money. Okay. So we know we have the money. Mm. We say where we are at the moment. We know we have the money. We have those properties in Cork. And right across the country, it's not just Croc. Draw mm. the, the, so there are the existing properties. We have the, the surplus from the tax. And, you know, we also have shown in the last few months, I mean, the war in Ukraine has been horrendous for people, but we have shown that we can move things pretty quickly. I'll give you an example. Around the corner from where Jude and I live, there's a an old convent that's been empty for the section that they're doing up at the moment has been empty for I don't know, a long time, decades. They're noting it up for, for Ukrainians, which I'm delighted. We're delighted, obviously. Mm. But it shows that they could have done that all along for people without a home. They're also building modular homes. So so I would say, like, okay, look, I mean, 
what would I do? I mean, straight away. I mean, there they are. They'll say there's challenges about skills and stuff. And of course, some of the, the thinking has to be long term. So I would advocate, obviously, for mix of private and state building. Some of the stuff would be more long term where I think we need a there's a huge lack of skills in Ireland, Connor. I mean, a huge lack. We know that ourselves uh, through the house we bought. We bought a 200 year old house and we're very, very slowly doing it up ourselves. But there isn't the knowledge. So there is that all these gaps do exist. But so if I had that role, definitely I would introduce extra measures initially. Compulsory sales and compulsory rental, meanwhile use and meanwhile housing. All these measures I would bring in quickly. I would get a state company in place and start building for that, working closely with the institutions, getting the skills base. If we need to bring in skills from abroad, bring them in from abroad, obviously, as well. But definitely we need a state company. We need to build up the skills. We need more measures. But also I would insist on enforcement. So if we, if we enforce the direction levies, it's as simple as that. We start with that straight away. And put the seven percent back on you and everyone else. That would have a huge change straight away. So, like, I suppose for me, if 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 we were to kind of make decisions, there is the toolbox of measures we'd want to bring him in straight away. And um, we have shown because people say it's not possible. We have seen the last year it is possible to change things really quickly. They they build the people with the skills for certain aspects, particularly for a more modern uh, building. There are, those skills do exist. The more difficult thing is if you're restoring some of the older buildings, like some of the heritage buildings do need skills like we're finding here. It's very hard to get people with, um, first, no one in our, that we've checked so far understands buildings in terms of breathability. So this is more on the technical side, but like if you have an old building and it's been made with lime and stone and brick, it's got to be breathable and that people don't understand that. So that's an education issue which will take longer to solve. But no, I mean, there are, I would, the first thing. There are is, instant measures, there are medium term, there are long term. But, but there's 160,000 vacant homes. Okay, right. so there's, there's 160,000 vacant. They're not supposed to be derelict. Surely compulsory rental of all of those. Like if you compulsory rented, maybe 50% of those straight away, or even 80, 25%. Mm. Imagine 40,000, Connor. 40,000 homes straight away back on the market now. Well, you, you could have a, th you, the, t the home can turn around into a, a, a rental property in three months, three to six yeah, months. Yeah. So, and like people say, oh, it's, see, the thing is, that's, oh, it needs to be certain standards. Like, I mean, okay, Jude and I are not fussy and we are decided to take on doing a lot of this work ourselves. And we're extremely slow because we're working commercially, we're campaigning. So mm -hmm. the house becomes the, the thing you do a day or two here and there. You know, and we've made that decision. But you, we, our house is not a perfect energy house. We're living in a house that was vacant that we bought it. It was kind of semi-derelict, really. You know, what people had been living up to a year earlier. It needs a lot of work. A lot of people I've chatted to who are in situations where they need a home, they'd be more than happy to go into not perfect houses and start working themselves. A bit of trust, a bit of responsibility, you know, work with them. And like a lot of these people are young, young men and young women who actually have a lot more energy. I'm in my 50s. It's much harder in your 50s to keep campaigning, keep commercial work going and also do up your house. I'm trying. But but like when I was in my 20s and 30s, I would have had a lot more energy. And so a lot, so a lot of people would, are willing to go in. It's this idea the house has to be perfect. No, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'll give you an example. There's a council house at Stone Stroke for where Jude and I live. There's a whole load of them actually, you can see. But this one's empty for five years, Connor. It's in a it's in a terrace of three or four houses, which were only probably built 20, 25 years ago. Five years, Connor, the council have left that empty. That could have been used the whole time. Well, I, I've heard this standards argument before from local authorities from, you know, we have to build and, and repurpose to certain standards. But it's the irony of it. Look at the state of the dereliction and they're talking yeah. about standards. Yeah, yeah. Well, totally. Kidding me. Like, it's, it's just... Yeah. It's completely yeah. nonsensical. Oh, uh, totally. It's totally. And I said, our house is not energy, whatever, blah, blah, Jude and I. You know, and maybe eventually it will be. Like, we're, we're, pro we're doing it well, but doing it slowly. So now we've the roof and certain So we're getting better. So it's getting mm. more better. Say. But, like, if we had to do that, we'd have to move out, go out for a lot. No, I mean, so I know a lot of people move in. Like you said, the standard's a good point. Like, it's derelict or it's, and there's no one living it. 
And, and you're talking about standards, about yeah, how we build it. It's crazy. And there's 300 people in the direct vision centre in Cork and Conceal Road where we visited the weekend mm. who are crammed in together, who, like a lot of lovely young men and women who would have the mid, who, would, who actually, but I was surprised at the weekend and so was Jude. Everyone we met, right, in direct vision was, was actually keeping the local economy going in Cork. They're mm. all our construction workers. They're all our retail people. They're all the people making the pizza for us for our takeaway. These are all, I didn't realize there was, so, so a lot of them have skills and construction and things. So they would be delighted to, here's this bacon slash derelict home. You mm. can move in. Don't expect it to be energy rated star, whatever. But we'll work with you. We'll support you. But we'll put a time frame out. We yeah. expect you within 18 months to have this much done. And within three years, do you know what I mean? Mm. And we'll support you on the process. We'll, we'll provide around that. There could be training programs, how to lime your building, how to plaster, how to, you know, put in a tile in your bathroom. All, all those things can happen in parallel. Mm. But they, they would be willing to take it on, I think. So, yeah, going back to that, like if we've, the data says 160,000 plus vacant. People will argue it's not that blah, blah, blah. That's not holiday homes either. And that's not derelict. That's just vacant. That's mm. the stats. Like I said, take 50%, take 25%. Open them up straight away. Get the people in there. Maybe get a proper contract in place. You know, you're not saying, oh, that's your house. You don't. You have to take responsibility. We've seen that in other countries. It's called stewardship. It's one of the things the measures you and I have argued for. More of a stewardship approach. Let people have the house. Let them work on the house. Give them the advice and guidance. But they have a roof over their head. They can start to build a family. They can mm. have... If they want to have kids, they can have kids. They can go to the local school. They can become part of society. And I think, like, again, I was shocked, but some of the people I met the weekend, they're, they're eight or nine years in direct vision. Um, Frank, what, what do you think the impact? We have a major problem, certainly up here in Dublin, um, with short-term lodging. Yeah, right. Yeah. So there's a couple of platforms. We all know who they are um, that are, and people are taking, you know, advantage. As they, you know, in, in, in a capitalist society, they have every right to, they take advantage of the short-term lodging. Tourists comes in, comes in, rents for a few days. They're gone and they're making great money. How impactful is that short-term lodging on the crisis? And is, what would you very, do? Yeah, it's very impactful. I think we, I would be a lot more stricter on that, to be honest. I mean, when we lived in uh, Amsterdam, uh, the Dutch had introduced a much more stricter rules. So you could do that, but only for certain days, you know, certain time frames, and it was your own home, whatever. So, like, I would... Definitely. If we weren't, look, it's like this, Connor. If we weren't in the middle of a housing emergency, if we didn't have people struggling in centres or on the streets, yes, you could let that market play out. Mm. But we're not. So I would come much more stricter. And you, a lot of those accommodations you talk about, they're not registered. So a lot of those are doing it without proper registration. So there needs to be a proper registration process for seat to know who's doing it. And then after mm. that, understand, is that something that should be allowed for a local area. And I think in many cases, unfortunately, they'll have to cut it back totally because um, you can't have... You could do a zonal thing with it. You could zonal thing. You could. They could do a lot of things. But at the moment, it's just going to be crazy. I mean, I thought you've seen it probably in social media, but a lot of people say there's no place for rent, for example, in such a town, but, mm. there's, but there's 20 uh, holiday lets for two days. But there's nowhere, there's nowhere for a family to move to. So, so like... Yeah. It's look, if if the market was working, it'd be much harder for me to take my kind of perspective. Of course, you could say, well, look, Frank, it's working. Mm. Everyone's got a home. But look, we all know it's not working. And I think in an emergency, the mere you need emergency measures. And I think we saw that. It's great that Ireland reacted so well initially to the Ukrainian stuff and allowed people to come and provide mm. support. They were being traumatized. Mm. Why can't we take that type of approach? with all the other people in Ireland and all the other refugees as well. Let's do it for everyone. Let's take a coordinated approach. We should not, I mean, again, we should not have 160,000 vacant homes. Like, mm. how does that, and people say, oh, they're not in locations people want to move to. Are, are we saying no one wants to move to Cork City? I know loads of people who'd love to live, live in Cork City Centre. So if there's 700 in Cork alone, vacant slash derelict, and I've been to, with Jude, we've been to, Amazing towns all over the country. We've been to Mallow, Ennis, Tralee, you name it. We've tried to go as many places as possible, take pictures and chat to people. All the towns and places we visited, bar a couple, there are a few who, who didn't have the levels of vacancy to our election, but most places we visited had high numbers. 
And I think uh, if there is a transport infrastructure in place, people are happy to move to these regions. It's different if you're putting people Knowledge in the Knowledge economy middle. workers can move anywhere, technically, in Ireland. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, and that's it. And, and like, may want to. Like, if there's, that's it. And I suppose that's go back to we need to invest in uh, much better urban environments where, like, one of the issues for Cork is not there, there are the vacant homes and the derelict homes, but Cork hasn't done enough to create parks, play spaces, creches, facilities for families. Mm. You know, it's a polluted city. There's no doubt about that. We come up very badly in terms of pollution. So, you know, green spaces. So put all those measures around, bring more people mm. into that environment. Your city will thrive and everyone benefits. Whereas at the moment, who benefits from their election and who benefits from people on the street? I mean, we all hate walking on the street and seeing people struggling. I mean, it, you know, and like going back to a place like the Dutch, I often think with the, with the Dutch is that there's a, going back to their pragmatic approach. They just don't want to see that. They don't want to walk down the street and see people struggling. They, they, it just, it's not what they don't have the headspace for it. They'd much rather see those people with somewhere to live and contribution to the economy. Well, you remember the famous George Bernard Shaw when he was in Parliament in the UK, he was asked about um, there, were, there was a plan to put toilets into people's houses. Yeah. And um, because there was a sewage problem in London and he was challenged in Parliament about the cost mm -hmm. of putting all these um, toilets into people's homes. And he made the point, it's not for their benefit, it's for mine. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if you don't want to do it for if you don't want to do it for your neighbor. Great point. Do Great it for point. yourself so that you don't have to walk down the, the 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 road and see sewage everywhere, right? Yeah, you know, it's it's about your quality of life as well as that's everybody exactly. else's. And that's, I think that's a great point. It really is. You know, like we don't want to walk down the street and see people struggling. We don't mm. want to walk down the street and see buildings that could collapse. There's a building in the bottom of street on the neighbouring street, and like it's just like Jude and I are sharing fairly regularly. I'm just waiting for it to collapse. And it's by a bus stop. I don't want to see it collapse. I don't want to see it falling on some kids or some local people. Mm. But, I mean, we're expected to collapse. It's it's now such an angle out, mm. you know, and you no, know, and we've highlighted it to the local authorities and that thing. So what do we have to wait till that falls down on some person? And uh, so yeah, no, that's a brilliant point. That is exactly it. If you can't do it for for them, do it for yourself. And I think that's mm. it. You know, like like. What I mean, like I said, I suppose, how do we get to this point? I mean, it's it's crazy that we've come back, you and I have come back to an Ireland that allowed this to be normalised. And I suppose if we've achieved stuff, one of the things we've achieved is that now people don't accept it and they're more inclined to challenge it. And it's become part, I suppose, of a national conversation, which is why it's recognised as a movement, that it's basically people are saying it doesn't have to be this way. And I suppose a lot of times too, I try and share more recently success stories. There are properties turning around and people want to see that too. Of mm -hmm. course they do. Because it must be pretty depressing looking at my Twitter feed. You know? Well, that was the last question I was going to ask you. Where can people find you? Now, I've been watching your 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 Twitter. It's not so much depression, it's it's rage mm -hmm. that yeah. I, I feel from, yeah. from watching it. Um, yeah, I think Twitter, Twitter is the best way to contact me and Jude. I mean, it's at Frank on the slash O'Connor and at you, Jerry. It's the best way to contact. It really gets the conversations going. And a lot of people don't like to really think it's too much. See, I'm not really, I'm not too, I kind of like the fact that it's discussions and debates, you know. I like the fact that there's a bit of interaction on Twitter. And um, I think for us, it's been amazing. Twitter has helped us build the community and the community have really been, got behind us and supported us and allowed us to engage like I said, we haven't had to contact any of the media. They've always come to us because there is a story. And I suppose what Jude and I have done so well is we've made the light so bright. You know, like we start out, I wanted to, I suppose I walk as well as an artist and stuff. And I wanted to take that artistic approach and say, there's a light. I'm shining on so bright. You cannot ignore me anymore. And I'm going to keep shining that light. And I'm going to keep challenging that until you listen. And that was why we started off was like, I'm going to keep doing this. And it was tough to keep doing it. And when you're doing it for three years, now, right. But there was times along the way you want to go, you know, you do wonder. But yeah, I think it shows the power of the community, the power of people and the power that like if you want things to change, you just have to believe it and you can you can make it happen. But we're very grateful to the support we've got and people like yourself who've contacted us and, you know, sharing our story. That's very important for us as well. So I appreciate that, Connor. 
Dr. Frank O'Connor, thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Connor. Thank you. And keep in touch, man. I will do.